Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. In Season 1 of the Alabama Short Stories podcast, we talked about Miss Liberty, one of the statues located in and around Birmingham. One of the big three, which included Miss Electra and the king, or god of them all, Vulcan. In this episode, we're going to talk about Vulcan's torch. But first, a little history lesson for those not familiar with Vulcan and why he's on Red Mountain. Iron built Birmingham. Not just the buildings, but the economy. It takes three raw materials to make steel. Limestone, iron ore, and coal. All three are found in abundance around Birmingham. Birmingham was founded in 1871, and the city exploded in growth, so much so that it was called the Magic City. By the end of the 19th century, Birmingham was the third largest exporter of pig iron globally, producing three-quarters of the United States exports. This upstart city was ready to flex its muscles and show the rest of the country what was happening in Birmingham. The 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exhibition in St. Louis, Missouri was chosen as the venue. This was also known as the 1904 World's Fair. Birmingham was planning to contribute the raw materials from the area when they learned that Alabama would not have an official exhibit. The Commercial Club of Birmingham decided to submit its plan to highlight Birmingham. Instead of sending the raw materials... What if they created a giant man made of those materials? I'm sure there were many suggestions about what this giant man would look like, but somewhere along the way they settled on Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, which included the fire of volcanoes, deserts, metalworking, and the forge. The committee set out to find their sculptor, and Giuseppe Moretti was commissioned. When Vulcan was depicted in sculpture and art through the centuries, he was usually shown with a blacksmith's hammer and Moretti followed tradition. His Vulcan would have a raised arm with a spear in his hand. Vulcan was looking down the shaft to make sure his spear was straight and true. Vulcan wore what I suppose would be a leather apron and nothing else. His backside was exposed to the world. How that got past any committee in the early 20th century Alabama is beyond me. Can you imagine the uproar today if that was proposed? Once Moretti's clay model was approved, he set about the production on what would become the largest cast iron statue in the world. His team created a full-size version of Vulcan in plaster at his studio in Passaic, New Jersey. The statue was made in sections so that it could be taken apart and shipped by train to Birmingham and the former Hood Foundry. The foundry was located at 1st Avenue North and 14th Street. Workers would use each section of plaster to create the molds that the iron would be poured into, making the final pieces. The statue was completed on time and sent to St. Louis. It made a huge impression on visitors. It was displayed in the Palace of Mines and Metallurgy, winning the grand prize. The statue was so popular that the cities of St. Louis, San Francisco, and Portland wanted the statue for their cities. There was even a proposal for the statue to be in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. In 1905, the statue made its way back to Birmingham and was deposited by the side of the rail tracks due to unpaid freight bills. The trip back damaged Vulcan's arms and the spear point was lost, which is where our story is going. But what to do with Vulcan? Proposals ranged from having him in the middle of what we now know as Lynn Park to the center of the five-point circle. Vulcan's bare bottom was probably too much for the local residents to have looming above them, so both ideas were dismissed. Vulcan was moved to the Alabama State Fairgrounds, where he was displayed until a more permanent place could be found. He was incorrectly reassembled with his arm twisted, the hammer and anvil behind him, and no spear in his hand. This allowed the State Fair authorities to use his hand for advertising purposes. He advertised Sherwin-Williams paints, Heinz Pickles, and Coca-Cola, among others. After 30 years of being an advertising shill at the fairgrounds, an appropriate home was found for the statue. The Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company, TCI, donated five acres of former mining land above Lone Pine Gap. 
Local groups raised funds, and with helps from the Works Projects Administration, they came together to fund and complete a 124-foot-tall pedestal that Vulcan would be placed. A new, smaller spear was created and added to Vulcan's hand. 35 years after he was created and sent to St. Louis, Vulcan finally had a home high above the city it was created to celebrate. The new spear created for Vulcan at his new home would not stay visible for long. For all of us who were alive at the end of the 20th century, we didn't know about Vulcan's spear. We only knew about the light he held in his hand a green or red popsicle that he was offering to the gods in his raised hand. This neon torch was all we knew. But why was it there? The Birmingham Junior Chamber of Commerce, better known as the JCs, was organized in 1920 to provide young adults networking opportunities and learn business skills. Leadership training was achieved through the roles taken on in projects they ran. In 1946, R. Paul Moon, chairman of the J.C. Safety Committee, was looking for a project to help reduce the increasing amount of deaths on the roads around Birmingham. He got the idea that a color-coded safety beacon that signaled when someone died in a car wreck would remind others to be careful on our roads. Moon's original idea was to have a beacon placed atop the flagpole outside the West End Library. Another idea was to put it on top of the Comer Building, what we now know as the City Federal Building, which would be much more visible. Then someone came up with the idea of having Vulcan be the bearer of bad news. A proposal was sent to the Birmingham Parks and Recreation Board for a temporary torch wrapped around the existing spear. The proposal was accepted, and the JC's campaign to fund the project went into high gear. The cone was designed to spin so that workers from Alabama Neon Sign Company could easily replace each of the 16 neon bulbs. If adding light to Vulcan's spear wasn't bad enough, metal climbing rungs were welded to his left hip and up across his chest to the arm. Cables were attached to his right hand and were strung to Vulcan's shoulder to help the worker climb the arm to the light. Work was completed and a light switch was installed in the guards room at the tower's base. For the next 53 years, the torch glowed green. When there was a traffic fatality, the light was switched to red. The idea was that motorists who saw the red light would be reminded to drive safely and watch out for others. From the front porch of my house in Homewood, I could see whether the torch was green or red. I didn't know if the campaign saved lives, but I do know that it made a big impression on me. A red light was something that we did not want to see. By the end of the 20th century, Vulcan had spent half of its life on that pedestal above the city, and it was falling apart. Updates needed to be made, and Vulcan was dismantled and sent to Robinson Iron in Alexander City for refurbishment. They also made a new spear for Vulcan to hold. The torch was being replaced, but not without controversy. Some people don't like change, and former Mayor George Siebels probably spoke for most of them when he said, it would be a total disaster to even consider taking the torch down. While Vulcan was in rehab, the entire Vulcan Park site was updated, or in some cases going back to the way things were. The 1970s updates were removed, a new elevator installed, and other updates made. When Vulcan came back, his position was adjusted slightly to the east, for a better profile view in Vulcan's anvil and hammer placement. It also meant that Homewood no longer received the full view of Vulcan's derriere, a view that was popularized in 1982 by the song Moon Over Homewood, written by WYDEAM disc jockey Jack Voorhees. If you never saw the torch in Vulcan's hand, you're still in luck. You can see it to this day in the museum at Vulcan Park. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Alabama Short Stories. If you enjoyed the story, there are a couple of ways you can help the podcast. The first is to tell a friend about the podcast. The second is to buy some merchandise from our store or donate to the podcast. You can find links at alabamashortstories.com. You can listen to the podcast on the website or wherever you prefer to listen and subscribe to podcasts. See you next time at Alabama Short Stories.